the space shuttle was the cornerstone of America's dominance in space for three decades. And yet many today are unaware that the shuttle concept was directly inspired by Star Trek. Before there was Atlantis, Discovery, Challenger, or Columbia, there was Galileo. This set piece would become one of the most iconic symbols of science fiction and space exploration ever. And her mission on Star Trek was only the beginning of her stories. My name is Jay Swinborn. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. I've uh, been a Star Trek fan for, what, actually since the 70s. Grand Slam convention in L.A., put on by creation, Star Trek, in the mid-80s. Went down there, uh, sitting in the audience. They had their no minimum bid auction. And they brought out these two pieces from the shuttle. Bidding started at, like, Ten, five bucks, something like that. It went up to 40, my bid was 45. And lo and behold, it was the last bid. And I ended up getting those two pieces. Last year in 2012, I was at the uh, Star Trek creation convention at the Rio. Uh, I was looking around and Gene Winfield was there selling photos of the original Galileo shuttle craft, the building of it, of the Galileo 7. And I looked at the photos and I saw the piece that I had in the photo. And I looked at it and I pointed to it and then I looked at Gene and he goes, yes, I built it. I'm Gene Winfield and I'm in the business of building custom cars and hot rods. This, this is the piece that I took into Gene and had him verify. And he did that it was an original piece that he had built for the original Sh Galileo 7 shuttlecraft. In 1966, actually prior to 66, I had my own shop in Modesto, California, building custom cars and hot rods and also some movie cars. So I went with AMT to manage their speed and custom division in Phoenix. And so then I went to the studio with a representative from AMT and we negotiated the deal to build the Galileo and give it to the studio completely free so that AMT could build the Enterprise into the model kit form. And then later we built the Galileo also into the kit form. While at the studio, uh, I went to Matt Jeffries, Walter M. Jeffries, his nickname, nickname was Matt. I went to him and he had a beautiful shuttlecraft already designed, a fabulous, just gorgeous, real sleek, beautiful ship. But so I went to him and I said, now I cannot build that in the short period of time. You know, I think we only had 30 days to build this complete unit. So he said, all right, you redesign it and bring back a rendering or a sketches of your version of the Galileo. And then I'll look at it and, and tell you yes or no. So I did that. I, I uh, totally designed it and I had a, a company do a rendering, a nice, beautiful colored rendering. And I took that back to uh, Jeffries and he said, oh yeah, great. That's fine. Signed it. Beautiful. He says, go to work. So then we built it. So of course I had to the reason I had to redesign it is to build it all out of flat sides and flat roof and everything so that I could build it in a hurry. And it was so large, you know, it was, it's approximately 14 feet wide and 28 feet long. So we had to build it uh, out of masonite and plywood and steel and, and all different uh, types of material so I could build it in 30 days. The way I got started then, after I got the okay from Jeffries, I, uh, 
<clears throat> took the rendering and I redrew a simple pencil sketch of the outline and then I designed the structure to go inside the basic structure which would be all the uh, like a frame a framework to be inside so I designed all of that within this uh, outer shape that we have and so I used uh, two inch square tubing for almost all of that after I designed the steel structure and had it mostly welded welded together then uh, I hired uh, two carpenters to come in and so with my crew that I already had in fact by the way Sam Foose was on my crew he was working with me Chip Foose's father you know he's the star of uh, all you know the show over Holland but anyway uh, so I hired these two carpenters because we had a lot of woodwork we hauled, hauled in a bunch of wood and everything and uh, started uh, the main construction with two by fours and things on top of my steel structure and then we bolted some of that together and it uh, it went along very well and uh, we kept going on it and we made some metal pieces on the curl edge up on the top out of sheet metal so I bent those on a, on a roll and and uh, so little by little it started coming together and then I had to go to an aircraft company to find that uh, rear foot you know I went actually I came over to Burbank Burbank California had big big uh, aircraft surplus places and so I looked around and I found this one oh it's just perfect in my eyes it was perfect so I bought that hauled it back to Phoenix and put that on and so little by little it went together then we of course for the the big um, the big tubes. We went to a um, a well drilling company that builds huge oil wells and things like that and water wells. And we bought the tubes from them. And then we made a mold for the uh, bubbles on the front of the nacelles where we put the uh, plastic bubble. I think we put a regular light in there, but then the studio took care of all the rest of it. The lighting and the special effects were all done by the studio. I think we put a simple light in there just so we could light them. The hardest part probably on the Galileo was forming the little areas around the windows. We had to sculpture a little, a nice little molding and come around there. And then also fitting the vessels to the side of the ship so that they would unbolt and, and fit up very nicely so they could be removed and go back together so we'd have a nice fit along there. So that was probably the hardest part. The rest of it was pretty much straightforward woodworking and uh, and shaping of wood and, and so forth and getting it ready to, we, we used a little bit of filler and a little bit of primer and things like that. So then once we got it all, the, the wood filler and, and, uh, and everything, and we primed it with automotive primer, and then we, we of course, we got up and block sanded that whole thing, you know, with uh, uh, regular sanding blocks, and we made long uh, sanding blocks that were like uh, almost three feet long, which now you can buy, you know, but, but at that time we had to make our own. So we block sanded it and everything with uh, primer and block sanding, much, much like automotive, just like we were going to paint a car. And then, of course, we had to get the, the colors were okayed by uh, Matt Jeffries and, and things like that. And so we painted it with the silver, silvery color. And then the studio actually put on the the graphics, the studio put on the final graphics at the studio. We created the doors that open, you know, the nice, uh, you know, kind of hex shape there on the doors and then uh, and split the doors and everything and just had them uh, laying there separate. Then the studio, uh, see, we didn't, we didn't have any money really to build this unit. We we're building it all for free for the studios. So the studio was going to rig the door so that it would open so the actors could come up and they're you know step in just like, like they're going to enter that that unit and uh, what they did was they put a, a series of cables inside and so they had a, a a prop guy in there pulling the cables to open the door it was never actually done with electric it was all just done by hand and then by the way at the same time we built this complete exterior unit. We also built a complete interior. Now the interior had what we called wild walls. Now every four feet, it was on wheels, every four feet down the sides and both sides would come in on wheels 
And so they could take away this side and film the point of view of the actors doing their dialogue, and this wall would be all up. Then they would take this wall away, put this wall up, and film the other direction for the other guy talking back and forth. And, you know, with the, uh, the movie work of, of Hollywood, sometimes this would not even be on the same day. So sometimes this guy would be talking to this actor on two different days, but as you see it on film, of course, it was all beautiful and like one day. And they also, in this wilds, uh, this, um, this unit, this interior unit that had the wild walls, they also have what they call a vertical ceiling. Now, the, the ceiling, you know, your side walls normally come up and they go in with the ceiling. And then all of a sudden, the ceiling turns and goes straight up. So the whole center section was a vertical ceiling and it's all painted the same color. So you don't know that it's there. And they do this for lighting. And so all the lighting, they would spend hours and hours lighting all through the top of this vertical ceiling so that when you see it, you have no idea the amount of work that goes into filming this kind of a unit. As far as the interior, uh, they wanted me to create a chair that was a little different. So I took a, a fiberglass chair and added side, side rails to it. So we had a nice wide, different side rail. And so we created this chair in there and we had a base for it that has a big cast aluminum knob so that you would supposedly turn it to tilt the chair back and forth. You see, I still have one of those knobs somewhere around here. I gotta find it because I still have the mold for the chair so I can reproduce those chairs. They had me build a simple console with a, uh, a slanted TV screen and then a lot of colored knobs, you know, all kinds of little square knobs and things like that. So I created that whole section for them and then they lit what they wanted to they, at the studio, the special effects people did the lighting and, and, and made some of those knobs work later. And there is a, a few uh, episodes that show them sitting at the console using, using that instrumentation there. As far as the creativity of those knobs, we found some of those at a, uh, at a electronic surplus place, in, also in Burbank, California. Went over there and I, I spent several hours in this facility and I bought all kinds of knobs and switches and, and things that are actually their little rocker switches and they're made to light up. So I, and then some of those we made by, by hand out of square plastic. We just cut plastic shapes and, and glued them in there. So some of them were very uh, dummy, you know, didn't work, what were not functional at all. Uh, at, at one episode, they, they put plexiglass in those front viewing windows. So they could actually blank them off with a, a black screen or they could open them up. So there was one episode where they had them as, as clear plexiglass so they could see through there. You know, I heard about after the series closed down, of course, and I heard that the Galileo was in up near Santa Barbara and, and then down near, um, I forget the city now, down near Long Beach or somewhere. I forget where it was, but I was kind of trying to keep track of it, and, and it, but not really trying hard. But then, then they called me from Ohio. A lady called me and said that she owned the Galileo and she was under the uh, reconstruction, uh, recreating or repairing the, uh, the Galileo. And she would like for me to come back to a, a science fiction show uh, in Ohio and of which I did, and I took pictures and things back there with me, and and then we took a few parts off of, of actually old old pieces off of the Galileo, and I autographed them, and they auctioned them off, and so forth like that. And then I lost track of it, and uh, I I always knew in my mind that it was stored in Ohio somewhere, and I but it was uh, I think they put it uh, put it away and tried to hide it so that there was too many people trying to find out where it was so they could come over and take pictures and, and she didn't want to do that. So then later, uh, Alex and Adam, Adam called me and, uh, and told me that they were going to the auction to try to buy it. And uh, of course they did buy it. And uh, then I went to a science fiction, um, a Star Trek science fiction show in, in uh, Las Vegas and met them and talked with them and so forth. 
So it's been a really great relationship. Now, I understand that they're going to fully restore it and repaint it and make it look exactly like it was when I finished it and then put it in a museum, which is great. It, it makes me feel wonderful that I was a part of it. You know, it's just like uh, I had no idea that, that Star Trek and, and the movie Blade Runner and some of the other ones have such a cult and such a following. It's just amazing to me to see when I go to the science fiction conventions, uh, how they dress up and they, they go so radical into the whole thing. It's just wonderful. I think it, I'm glad that I was a part of it.